Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. If you would please stand, take a hymnal, turn to number 426. 426, we'll sing the first verse and then we'll move around and make everyone welcome. And then we'll sing verses 2 and 3. I'm sorry, I said the wrong number. Um, number 514. I wrote them down, then I made the, then I made the order. I'm sorry. 514. Good to see you all. Happy Mother's Day to you. God bless you. Hope you had a good start to your Mother's Day. We had a Mother's Day breakfast this morning. Appreciate everybody who came, especially appreciate the guys that came early. Got it all going and just thankful for that. And hope the rest of your Mother's Day is good. Bulletin has announcements in it. Wednesday night is our final Wednesday of our school schedule. Getting ready for the summer schedule. We'll be having a big pizza bash and recognizing workers and uh, doing some vacation Bible school registration. So if you'd like to come back for that on Wednesday, that's at 6. Uh, Bible school will be starting up in a couple of weeks. Note the details about those meetings and preparation times and things like that that's there in the bulletin. There's some registration 
forms out in the foyer. Appreciate everybody that's already filled some of those out and got them into the office. But we'll be taking the next two or three weeks. So if you've got a child and or a teenager wants to come to Bible school, we'll get them registered as soon as possible. And that's the first full week of June is our Bible school this year. We'll say more about that next time we get together. Uh, this morning we want to worship. We want to welcome you for worship. And uh, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you for our mothers present and those that have gone on. And pray, Lord, that you would just remind us how much you love us and you demonstrate that oftentimes through our mothers. And we thank you so much for them and pray that this day, the rest of this day, will be a day of great uh, refreshment for them with children, grandchildren, even great-grandchildren in some cases. A day, a beautiful day, beautiful weather day that you've given families today for this occasion. And pray that we would remember not only our mothers, but that you're our Heavenly Father and how you take care of us, how you provide salvation through Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Now you can turn to 426. <laughs> 426, and we'll do all three.
inside your bulletin, there's an insert about the Mother's Day offering from the Baptist Children's Home over there in Carmi. We drove over there the other day to pick the girls up. There's a whole lot of water over there. And this pink envelope is associated with that. If you'd like to give today or over the next couple of Sundays, uh, the Baptist Children's Home, many of you are very familiar with that great ministry, and we've had people from there here to speak and to relate it to us, but we normally take up a special offering around the Mother's Day time of year to help supplement some of their needs, so if you came expecting that, then you could give today. If not, maybe over the next couple of weeks, we'll continue to do that. That's what that's all about. If you're able to, that's great. If not, that's great too. It's as the Lord leads. Uh, We do also include the children's home in our budget. So a percentage of what we give every Sunday goes to that ministry, but this is an extra offering taken up through the year by probably the majority of Southern Baptist churches in the state of Illinois because it's such a great ministry, but that's what that's all about. Chrissy, what's next? Number 215. And we'll go through this twice. our offertory hymn. Would the ushers please come on the last verse? 550.
Thomas A. Dorsey is known as the father of black gospel music. He is the first African-American songwriter to be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. He started out as a blues and jazz pianist, but in his early 20s, he gave up what he called the worldly pursuits to devote his talent to God. In 1932, he and his wife, Nettie, lived in Chicago. He went to St. Louis for business. She stayed in Chicago as they were awaiting the birth of their first child. While in uh, St. Louis, he received a telegram from Chicago that Nettie, his wife, had died in childbirth. He uh, took a train back to Chicago, and when he got to Chicago, he also discovered that his infant son had died as well. He said, I felt like God had done me a disservice, and I didn't want to serve him anymore. But eventually, through the intervention of a friend and a piano, he began to play and sing. And he sat down at the piano, and he said it was almost like the Lord Almighty guided my hands across the keys. And Thomas A. Dorsey, from the deep pit of grief, birthed this song. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if not, the person next to you probably wouldn't mind if you looked over their shoulder. The book of Ruth. The book of Ruth this morning. Joshua Judges Ruth. 
chapter 1. came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, and if you want to know what that was like, look at the previous verse in the previous book. It was a time of personal iniquity, national idolatry, and societal anarchy. It was a wild time. It was a bad time in the nation of Israel. Things were tough. And as a result, Ruth 1.1 says there was a famine in the land. The book of Deuteronomy and other places, God said to His chosen people, walk with Me, talk with Me, worship Me, honor Me, and you'll be blessed. Turn from Me, turn to other gods, you'll be judged. You'll be disciplined. And so it was during this time the judge's time, about 1200 B.C. to 1000 B.C., give or take a decade or two, a time when there was no king, when it was basically anarchy, every man doing that which is right in his own eyes, chaos in society, in the community, in the home, that there was a famine, verse 1, in the land. And there was a man of Bethlehem, He went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and two sons. The man's name was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. The name of their two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons They took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. She heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voice and they wept. And they said, Surely we'll return with you to your people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that that they may be your husband's? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, it grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and unto her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Now when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking to her. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara." For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, 
saying, The Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. This thing we call Mother's Day began officially in 1908. A young woman named Anna Jarvis wanted to have some sort of recognition for mothers, specifically her own mother. So she arranged for a recognition service in her mother's home church in Grafton, West Virginia. It was an immediate success. By 1911, every state in the Union at that time was observing some sort of Mother's Day celebration. And in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson made it official, decreeing that the second Sunday of May would be Mother's Day. And we've observed it that way ever since. But Mother's Day, which was meant to be a simple, personal, family recognition, soon became commercialized. You know, in a capitalistic economy, some people will capitalize. And so Mother's Day very quickly became a marketing and profit sort of holiday. This highly offended Anna Jarvis, and she spent the rest of her life crusading against the profiteering of Mother's Day. At one time, she had 33 lawsuits pending against companies who sold cards and flowers and candy and all other sort of Mother's Day gifts. In one of her many pleas to preserve the purity of Mother's Day, she said, quote, As the founder of Mother's Day, I demand that all this cease. Mother's Day was never intended to be a source of profit, unquote. Well, obviously, Anna Jarvis' campaign did not stop Mother's Day from becoming the cash cow that it is today. Uh, Last year, worldwide, $200 billion, with a B, $200 $200 billion was spent on Mother's Day. And ironically, Anna Jarvis never married, and she was never a mother. She died in 1948, blind, broke, and bitter. In a Reader's Digest article interview shortly before her death, Anna Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day, said this, quote, I'm sorry I ever started Mother's Day. Anna Jarvis has something in common with the lady in our story this morning. The story of a mother who got bitter and how the mother got better. Verse 19 tells us that in Bethlehem, they were all abuzz when they saw her come into town. Look, they said, it's Naomi. And somebody said, who's Naomi? And they said, oh, you remember Naomi. She left. She and her husband and two boys, they went to, uh, I think they went to Egypt. Didn't they go to Egypt during the famine? No, 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 said another woman. It wasn't Egypt, it was Moab. Oh, that's right, that's right, she went to Moab. Oh, a God-forsaken place to go, even in a famine. And they were talking, as women do, you know, when you want to spread news in a small town, telephone, telegraph, tell a woman. So they were all talking, and, and they were at buzz when they saw her coming down the road. And uh, one said, how long has she been gone? Oh, I don't know. It's been a long, you know how time gets away from it. It's been a long time. Got to be, oh, eight, nine, maybe ten years she's been gone. Who's that with her? Who's that? Where's her husband? Where's her boys? They should be young men by now. And here they come up in verse 19. As they get closer, you see there in verse 19, they say, is this Naomi? Is that you? We thought it was you. Is it you? And she says in verse 20, no, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, bitter. She says there in verse 20, the almighty El Shaddai is the Hebrew term there. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. He's dealt me a bitter hand at the card table. He's given me a bitter 
pill to swallow. It's bitter. My life is bitter. And he is responsible. Here is, by her own admission, a bitter woman, a bitter mother. So what is bitterness? Bitterness has been defined many ways. Here's several. Bitterness is anger turned inward. Bitterness is unforgiveness fermented. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for other people to die. Bitterness has been called emotional suicide. Bitterness is the only contents that destroys its container. Bitterness is when hurt changes from experience to belief. We've all been hurt, and we've all hurt. The old adage says, hurt people hurt people. But bitterness happens is when that hurt moves from an experience that I had to a belief that I hold, a belief that I'm not truly holding, but a belief that holds me. And she was bitter. Her life had taken a strange and unexpected twist, turn. When her husband had said, we're going to Moab. Even though God had said he dwelt in Israel, even though God said don't go to Moab, even though Moab was a God-forsaken, idolatrous people, her husband said we have got to go to Moab. They thought it was God's will, and when they got there, they found out things were not quite as they thought. She was faithful to her husband. She followed him. He was the head of the house. He was the spiritual leader of the family. She did the best she could. I can imagine them getting there to Moab, finding a little house, and her just doing everything she could in her motherly way to make it a home for her husband and those two boys. And for a while, I guess things went well. There was bread on the table, and there was milk in the glass, and I guess everything was better in Moab than it was way back in Bethlehem. Ironically, Bethlehem means the house of bread. They left the house of bread in search of bread. But then things changed and she became bitter. Maybe you've experienced bitterness as a mother or as a person. Maybe you know a person who's presently going through a deep time of bitterness. Bitter people are kind of like porcupines. They got a lot of good points, but you can't get close to them. (laughs) Wonderful people, but stay away. There's an anger, there's a smoldering resentment, there's an unwillingness to forgive and and go on, there's there's a fault-finding, critical nature about something in life that has settled on them like a storm front sometimes settles in and just drenches an area. It's like a dark black cloud and they're bitter. And that's the way she is after this, this period in the land of Moab. So from Naomi, this bitter mother, jot down these four causes of bitterness in her story that may be true of you or have been true of you or may be true of someone that you know and love. Do you know a bitter person? Do you know a person that's just bitter? It doesn't make any difference how many good things you show them. They always see the bad How many joyful things you talk about, they always point out the sad. Just just bitter. And that's Naomi at this time. One thing that brings on bitterness is often heartbreak and loss. There in um, verse 21, she says, I went out full. No, you didn't. There was a famine in the land. But she thinks she did. She's bitter. Bitter skews our perspective. Bitter, Bitter sways our viewpoint. Bitter causes us to be off balance emotionally. But she says, I went out full and I came home empty. There in verse 1 through 3, we see the sad situation when her husband died. She became a widow. According to the U.S. Census statistics, there's over 11 million widows in the United States. 700,000 women become widows each year. Nine out of ten wives will be widows. 
Nearly 50% of women over 65 are widows. Death of a husband is the number one stressor, according to the American Psychiatric Association for Women. 60% of women experience serious illness the first year after the death of their husband. 75% of a wife's support is lost after the death of a husband. Her life patterns are altered. Her nutrition and nourishment declines. Her interaction with people decreases. Her isolation increases. Her sleep patterns are severely impacted. I remember one time talking to a lady whose husband died, and she told me with tears, Brother Rob, the only way I could sleep was to take his old work coat and wrap up in it. It's the only way I could, I could sleep that first year. And Naomi is experiencing and has experienced the heartbreak of loss. She went the better half. She came back the bitter half. So bitterness can sometimes be caused by a heartbreak, a loss, something that we're not able to process or unwilling to process. Sometimes, number two, bitterness is caused by a lack of affirmation. Verses 4 and 5 tell us about the death of her children. She had two boys. I imagine they were as different as night and day, but she loved them both. And after her husband died, she leaned on them heavily. She leaned on them constantly. Even though they had married foreign women, pagan women, I'm sure as a mother she didn't approve of that. You know, mothers like to pick who's going to be the sons-in-law and daughters-in-law, and she didn't have much choice in the matter being in Moab. But then they died, and I can imagine one of the last things in her sight line as she went from Moab back to Bethlehem some 100 miles, she looked over her shoulder many times. I can imagine her seeing those three graves. Her husband and both her boys, healthy, hopeful, just 10 years earlier, and now they're buried in Moab. Would she ever get back? Would she ever lay flowers on their graves? I don't know. But she never got any Mother's Day gifts from her boys. She never got any more cards. They never put their arms around her and said, we love you, Mom. And mothers need affirmation. Mothers need that constant reminder that their love and their care, that their instruction is appreciated, that it makes a difference. Not just on Mother's Day, but every day, consistently. And when a mother or a person, if you're a person here, and if you're here, you're a person. (laughs) Affirmation not received over time can lead to bitterness, a feeling that nobody cares, nobody understands me. Uh, in my life as a preacher, I've had a few people that really believed in me. And, and I mean that. I mean, I know everybody appreciates the preacher and all that, but I mean, I have had a few people in my life that really got me. They really understood me. And when those people pass away, when those people are gone, and you don't get a phone call from a Claude Hampelman, for instance, and uh, you don't get a, a card from somebody in Florida that was an old preacher that used to take a liking to you. It can create a sense of longing and uh, misunderstanding and sometimes bitterness as we go on. And so a lack of affirmation. uh, Her daughters really didn't understand her that much. Her daughters-in-law, they were Moabites. They were pagans. They were doing the best they can. But she felt lonely She felt empty. She felt unaffirmed. She felt unappreciated. And I know many of you mothers can identify with that. And let that go on long enough. Your kids go off and forget about you. They don't call. They don't come by. Or if there's animosity in the family, if there's difficulty in the family, and nobody speaks over time, it can create a great sense of bitterness as as we go on. And Naomi's experiencing that. She's a bitter mother at this point. 
So heartbreak and loss can cause bitterness in a person. Lack of affirmation over time can cause bitterness in a person. Number three, occasionally our own expectations can create bitterness. Four times between verses oh, 6 and 18, she tells her daughter-in-law to go back. Go back. Turn again is the King James rendition. Go back. And I'm sure that Naomi, like most women, as she moved to a new place, a new adventure, a new season of life, she had expectations, how she thought things were going to be. But many times our expectations are either idealistic or unrealistic. But we set ourselves up sometimes. We don't intend to because we have hopes for the future. We think it's going to be like this when we start out on a new path, a new job, a new place, a new thing, whatever it is. But then reality sets in, and it's not like we thought it was, and our idealistic or our unrealistic expectations can cause us to be bitter. I didn't think it was going to turn out like this. I didn't expect this. Why is it like this? It's not fair. It's not right. He brought me here, and now he's dead. (laughs) I had my boys, and now they're gone. And here I am with these two daughters-in-law. Ah, what am I going to do with them? You can imagine, day after day after day. But finally in verse 6, the Lord lifts the famine from the land and she hears about it through the grapevine some, some way. And that brings us to the fourth reason why sometimes we experience bitterness. We just misunderstand the plan of God. God has a plan for our lives, but we misunderstand it. We don't see it. We don't see the big picture. And how could we? And many times we feel like when life doesn't go right, when our kids don't turn out right, when I got divorced and it didn't work out with the marriage, when moving to a new place turned out to be the wrong place and now we're stuck in this place. <laughs> we, we, we want to blame God. I always feel sorry for atheists. They don't have anybody to blame. But anyway, <laughs> think about that after lunch. But... We often blame God, and that's what she does there in verse 20, 21. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. God is against me. He's afflicted me there in verse 21. She says, the Lord has testified against me. The Almighty has afflicted me. She sees God as being responsible for her calamity, for her situation, because she refuses to deal with the whole situation properly, she winds up being a bitter mother. But even bitter mothers, and she's very bitter, uh, most people won't admit they're bitter, ask them, ask your bitter person, are you bitter about it? No, (laughs) no, I'm just having a bad day. Well, you know, most of those people have had a bad life. (laughs) Longer than a day. But she readily admits, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. It's not right. The Lord's against me. My husband's dead. My boys are dead. Ten years of my life has gone by. What am I going to do now? I mean, they didn't have any welfare. They didn't have any social programs. She's destitute. And now she's got this pagan Moabite daughter-in-law tagging along like a shadow. What am I going to do with her? You can just hear her. She's bitter. And she admits readily she's bitter, but she got better. (laughs) She's the bitter mother better. How do you do that? How does a bitter mother get better? How does a bitter person get better? Three brief things I'd like you to write down, and then I'll be done. Number one, she returned to God. Listen, if you don't return to God, you'll never get better. I don't care if you're bitter or not. I don't care if you're here today and and you're living in sin, or you're wandering away, or you're not where you ought to be, if you don't return to God, you'll never get better. The Bible calls that repentance. The word repent means to turn around. It means to change your mind, metanoia. You're going one way. It's like if you was in the army, to the rear march. You're marching one way, and you turn on a dime, and you go the other way. You go God's way. You go the right way. And she did that. She got word there in verse 6 that the Lord had visited His people and giving them bread. And she said, that's all I need to hear. I'm going home. Now, she had a process to go through, but it has to begin at a point in time. So she returned to God. 
She went home. She went home. I was involved in a funeral for a mother Friday. I'll be involved in a funeral for a mother in the morning. And I was talking to the daughter, one of the daughters of the mother, on Friday as I was leaving. We had to go get the girls in Kentucky. And uh, I said to her, I said, you know, no matter how far you go, you never get far from home. And Naomi's realizing that. And she's going to go home. Not just a physical home, not just a a national home. She's, She's going to go home. She's going to go back to God. She's going to return to the Lord. And that's where bitterness becomes betterness, that first step towards Him. We sometimes sing that song softly and tenderly. You know, Jesus is calling, come home, come home. Ye who are weary or bitter (laughs) or whatever, come home. And so she returned to God. Number two, she released the past. She let it go. She released the past. I said this before, but you never make a better future by trying to make a better past. You'll never have a better future trying to make a better past. It's gone. I was reading about Robert E. Lee, that great general from the Confederacy, great southern gentleman. The Confederacy had lost the Civil War, and Lee was taking his horse and going through communities and talking to people as they were grieving and working through the whole process of reconstruction and rebuilding. He was there in Virginia, And a young lady came running out from behind one of these great southern Virginia mansions and she was crying and she was grabbing a hold of the stirrups of Robert E. Lee's horse and she said, General Lee, General Lee, you've got to come. You've got to see General Lee. Come and see. And so he got off of his horse and walked around the back and there was this massive old oak tree with the moss hanging. And it was splintered by the musket balls of the northern troops and, and the limbs were drooping and broken on the ground. And she said, General Lee, this is my family's tree. My family came from England generation after generation. My great-great-granddaddy planted this tree and look what they've done. Look what the damn Yankees have done to my tree. And Robert Lee Lee said, you've got to let it go. Cut it down and go on. And that's what you've got to do with your bitterness. That's what you've got to do with the damn Yankees in your life. You've got to cut it down and go on. And that's what she did. She returned to God and she released the past. Number three, I'm almost done. She rejoiced. She rejoiced. Verse 22 says, They got there at the beginning of the barley harvest. She rejoiced. You say, that's it? Try it sometime. Try it when you're so bitter and sour, you look like you've been baptized in pickle juice. (laughs) Try to stand up on both your legs and just praise the Lord. Try it. Change your life. It'll change the life of people around you. She rejoiced. You know, we're right in the middle of this book. You should never judge a book by its middle. And if you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, at the end of this book, you're going to find Naomi with a big smile on her face and a little baby in her lap. Now, that'll make any mother better. And she's got that little baby, that little Obed, because Ruth, that pagan Moabitess daughter-in-law of hers, is going to meet her Boaz. And Boaz and Ruth are going to have a baby named Obed. And Obed's going to have a baby named Jesse. And Jesse's going to have a baby named David. And David eventually going to have the son of David, the greater than David, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Jesus makes every bitter mother better. Jesus makes every bitter person better. Jesus makes it better. Jesus makes it better. So she was a bitter mother better. Life is hard. Life is full of hard experiences. Life is full of tough times. And it's easy to sit down and become sour and become bitter, especially on a day like this that is bittersweet for many people. But God has something more for you, mother, dad, person here today. There is more to your story. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And He's asking you, no matter where you're at today, to turn to Him 
Trust in Him and allow Him to lead you and guide you from this day forward. Would you do that? I mean, would you have enough sense to just say yes to God and trust Him today and begin walking with Him from this point forward and allow Him to take care of the deepest parts of your life, the heartaches, the heartbreaks, the difficult situations, and allow Him to redeem them and use them. We often like to quote that Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. Let me tell you, that includes bitter things. He works all that together for good, and He'll do that for you if you'll trust in Him today. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our mothers today, first of all. Mothers here today that have been through heartbreak and loss. Mothers here today who thought it was going to be different, but it's, it's, it's not what they thought. Mothers today that, that need desperately to have a, a man, a husband to affirm them, sons or daughters to affirm them, to let them know that, that they're doing well, that they're, they're making a difference, that they're loved, that they're appreciated. And Lord, if there be ladies here that's not getting that like they should, don't, don't let them get bitter over it. It's easy to get bitter over the situations we face in life. It's easy to look at you and say, God, it's your fault. I'm blaming you for this. You put me here. You did this. You gave me that husband. You gave me those weird kids. You gave me this. You did that. It's your fault. I don't like it. I'm bitter. Help us, Lord, to turn from those self-inflicted wounds and help us to turn to the wounds of our Savior who gave His life for us, who paid the price for us, who laid it down for us, that we could be better and better and better. And Lord, as we go through the rest of this day, remind us of Your great love for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. What you got? What's that? What's the number? 312, Allison says, the song she's picked out. 312, let's stand together and make this our hymn of invitation, our hymn of decision. 312, you come as we sing. Oh, sinner, come.